Howdy there folks, welcome into today's video. I got an exciting one to react to. This is a two for one in this video here today. We're gonna to react to this video first. I'm still inclined to reestablish another long position in the queues, which I think is an important video to kind of check out here and the, some of the points that are made. And if you wanna get into tech now, hold for the next two to five years, that's okay. And uh, I wanna to react to that one there because I think there's an interesting point that's made. Thank you for joining me. As always, I appreciate all you guys uh, for being here. We are now over 8,000 subscribers already on this channel, which is absolutely fun. Flipping my flapjacks, that's crazy. So I appreciate every single person that's uh, subscribed over here to the new reaction channel. Also, just so you guys know, I got a massive deal coming up on Labor Day for my number one stock market course ever, which is called Become a Master of the Stock Market. So if you want access to that deal and you want to uh, basically get that deal to your inbox when the deal drops, on Labor Day, go ahead and sign up for this and uh, we'll send you over the deal once it drops uh, for that flash sale on Labor Day, okay? Alrighty guys, uh, that will be pinned comment by the way. Let's get into this. On set, CNBC contributor, member of the investment committee. The state of the rally is where I want to begin with you. Mike Santoli said the market is caught in between ahead of Powell. I agree. Think? Well, for, first of all, today was a classic August. It feels like a Sunday day. The volumes were incredibly light, but I'm still Scott inclined, and I know I'm in the consensus, and the emails are going to come in really quickly, and I don't look at Twitter a lot, but I'm, no, I'm going to get the negative tweets. I'm still inclined to try and find a spot here within the moving averages to take and reestablish another long position in the queues. So, okay, I know you were talking about that the last couple of days. Why are you more inclined to buy today than you are to sell? Okay, so, so first off, it's important to remember, you know, when it comes to a lot of these uh, folks uh, on Wall Street that go on to a program like this on CNBC, the important thing to remember with, with folks like this, okay, or <clears throat> they are much more traders, okay? These are not usually folks, for the most part, are not usually folks that are looking to buy, let's say, the Qs and hold it for the next five years or the next three years or something like that. A, a gentleman like this, he's looking to play it a little more short term. And so sometimes those, uh, those um, let's just call it perspectives, are interesting to listen to because as a long, we're always trying to figure out, should we buy heavier? Should we lay back a bit? Should we cash up? Things like that. And so I think it's always kind of just interesting to kind of hear some of these shorter term folks' feelings on you know the state of the market and how bullish or bearish they are on the state of the market currently. I think, I had to listen to the halftime report, Josh did a great job talking about this. You bump your head against the 200 day moving average, okay, that's where the, the momentum, uh, it, it disappears for the bulls. Yeah, well you knocked your head right on that, that Knocked wall, your head right and on you it. you fell back, that's you the problem. You fell back, okay, now you're falling back into the support. You're falling back into the 100 day moving average. You're falling back into levels where the market actually began its advance. And you're doing that concurrent with positioning, as reported by the CFTC, that shows us leveraged funds and asset managers are still maintaining overwhelmingly bearish positions. In That's important. They are maintaining, so Wall Streeters in general are maintaining overwhelmingly bearish positions, okay? So this basically means that those folks are betting that the stock market's going to go down, right? And maybe they're going to be right, and the stock market does go down a bunch more. Or, or maybe they're going to be completely caught off sides in this situation. You're going to see massive short squeezes, and you're going to see all that, that short money, that overwhelmingly bearish money start to move to the bullish side. That's something... The extent of those bearish positions we have not seen since 2008. So I'm going to take. It's important we have not seen that level of bearishness since 2008. And, you know, I understand we've got a lot of negative stuff that has gone on in the market over, over this year, in 2022, right? Between inflation, between the Fed pulling back, between uh, obviously real estate slowing in a massive way, which honestly, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually a good thing. Um, there's, there's so many various things, right? The whole Russia situation, we had oil prices flying high going into the summertime. There's a lot of negative stuff that's going on in the market, right? But if you compare this to 2008, very, very different scenarios. In 2008, we had almost the entire banking system collapse. There was a whole different dynamic there. The amount of funds that were going under, banks, investment banks, that were literally just failing, that institutions that people thought would never fail were going under. It was, you know, to see that level of bearishness is I don't want to call it laughable, um, but it's, uh, I would call it a little silly because that was a whole different dynamic, man. You know, you can't even really compare what's going on now versus what's going on in 2008. They were night and day different.
that low risk trade. I'm going to take that low risk trade here at some point on the expectation that guess what? We make another return to the 200 day moving average because I think that's where most people in the market are actually going to feel the most pain if you break above the 200 day moving average because Scott, they're not positioned for it. Better hope. You better hear that there? They're not positioned for it. That's very important. They're, you know, so many on Wall Street are not positioned for an upside rally right now. And, um, you know, if you're not positioned for that and it happens, you are caught way off sides in a situation. You, if you're short, you have to cover your shorts, right? And then you have to say, okay, if I'm holding cash, do I go ahead and go long now, right? And this is why I, I say, you know, forget trying to be a trader because there's so many of these things you got to look at, right? And if you're bearish on the market, just because it goes above the 200 day moving average or something like that, right? Or now magically you're going to be bullish on the market, right? Now do you go, uh, you know, flood your money into the, the market? Like that, that's a tough decision. That's why I always say, you know, when it comes to trading, oh my gosh, and trying to get in and out of these stocks into those sorts of things, it is such a, a losing game because these, <laughs> these decisions are really, really hard, right? I was not hawkish on Friday because... You're going to have a problem with that, right? How's the market going to get back towards the 200-day moving average if Powell on Friday is hawkish? Well, from in, in the near term, if he is overwhelmingly hawkish, you're correct. We're not going back to the 200-day moving average. So you're going to need a little help you know, here. Overwhelmingly. I mean, what if he's just hawkish? Well, what if he leads you to believe that that pivot that everybody was focused on for a while after his speech mm-hmm. with the last meeting was junk. No, no there is no pivot. Wait a second. The Fed's already done that. The Fed's told you there's no pivot. Maybe there's a pause at some point. Maybe there could be a pause, but there's no pivot. I, I don't. I think the Federal Reserve has done a really good job in in communicating that. But if he if he puts things on the table on Friday that suggest, look. 75 basis points. We told you in the press conference in July, 75 basis points, that's highly unusual for the Federal Reserve. Don't get comfortable with us doing that at every meeting. If he kind of hints that, well, maybe we are going to be consistently giving you 75 uh, point hikes in the coming meetings, that's overwhelmingly hawkish. You're not going mm-hmm. back to, up to the 200-day moving average at that point. All yeah. right, so Jan Hatzius, Goldman Sachs, a little while ago, quote, we expect Powell to reiterate the case for slowing the pace of tightening laid out in his July press conference and the July minutes released last week. We continue to expect the, the Fed to slow the pace of rate hikes to 50 in September and 25 in November and December. That's a bullish scenario. Yeah, that, that's, I, I would say I believe that as well. The only way I think this doesn't happen is a scenario where the economy weakens considerably more and um, companies really are reporting very, very bad numbers in late October and early November because that's when a lot of big techs are going to report. And if that was to happen, then I could see them not even doing a 25 basis point move because that would be like basically two or three quarters in a row where companies are reporting troubling numbers and things like that. So I think I think they will do 25 basis points as long as the economy is not in the uh, dumper. Let's just call it that, okay? And as long as things are okay, they'll likely do that move as well. So I, I'm a, in agreement with that. I think 23 is a real debate if they raise at all in 23. I think that's the big debate. Or if at some point in 23 they cut, I think that's another big debate. For the market, isn't it? So so that's, that's where you return to the 200-day moving average. And again, is the street position for that? I, I don't think that they are. Look, I don't want to come across as overwhelmingly bullish where I think we're taking out. I'm not saying we're taking out 4,800. I'm just trying to identify a trend within a trend if I could find one, right? I actually think the market is going to trade between, uh, you know, 3,600 and 4,800. When, when he says 4,800, by the way, um, what he's kind of referring to is that would be right around all-time highs for the S&P 500 right now. We're at about 4,100. So obviously, if we went up to 4,800 by the end of the year, that would be a massive bullish move. And People are not positioned for a move to 4,800. I can tell you that. That would be, uh, man, there would be a lot of people caught off sides if that did happen. Uh, folks like Tom Lee do believe that we are going to 4,800 by the end of the year. So just kind of some food for thought. Other folks are, you know, in the threes uh, if they're on the more bearish side. For an extended period of time while we work through the course of time. But back to Jan's note, if in fact the Federal Reserve Chairman is indicating that, guess what? 75 basis point hikes that's highly unusual and we're no longer leaning in that direction we're going to give a 50 basis point hike and we're going to take a look in november december and see what we need accordingly that's that's welcome news now what is yeah, it november and december that's so long away think about this for a moment right 
uh, you know, we're going to have another three, we're going to have another three, you know, CPI data come out before then, right? So that's going to give us a good indication on what's going on with inflation and the PPI as well, right? And so the producer price index, we're going to see all that information over the next kind of three months. If we see CPI and PPI continue to come down, down, down in terms of the rate of growth, that gives the Fed even more uh, kind of ammo behind them to just do the 50 basis points coming up here and then maybe not even potentially do a 25 basis points in November, December, or just stick with that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if we continue to see that come down, the, the Fed's not going to be in any aggressive manner to just keep raising at 75 basis points, 50 basis points or anything like that. Now, if, you know, CPI and PPI go insane, then we're at a, a whole different kind of dynamic there. And uh, they will have to continue to raise at like a 75 basis point points and 50 basis points, uh, you know, for the next, let's just call it few times, that would be a situation where longs would be caught way off off sides there and uh, would be in a lot of trouble because then we're talking about that's a potential that if that happened, NASDAQ's going back down that 10.5 range again, or maybe even below that, maybe 9,700, which is kind of where we were prior to Rona. Um, but that, that you need really, you're going to need energy prices, especially to go up if you're going to talk about CPI going to those sorts of numbers. Don't make plans on Tuesday, September 13th. I know you're not, yeah. but that's a big day, isn't it? It's, it's funny, though. When you say a trend within a trend, I'm thinking, okay, you're gaming for a little bit of an uptrend within a, a bigger downtrend because, I mean, we're still in a downtrend. Okay, so what, what's wrong with taking 5% out of the market? I mean, back in, in July when market broke above, the S&P broke above the 50-day moving average, you, you were able to capture an easy 10% if you rode that momentum wave higher. I think you could do something similar. You could do something similar with a break above the 200-day that's catalyzed by the chairman being less hawkish as you move to September 13th when at 8.30 in the morning get CPI and okay, here's reality. All right, so We're hoping things you know, pick up. I am going to... Uh, <laughs> Now, a video like that, right? It's a, this one's going to be more of a long-term focus one that I think is more important. But uh, you know, a video like that, you know, from that gentleman, obviously so trading focused, and you know, he's talking about even trying to get you know, back out of the market. Hey, we're going to make some money here, you know, for the next bit of time and the, these things. You know, I just think. I think perspectives like that are interesting to listen to and things like that, but I just don't think, you know, as a retail investor or any investor, even for those guys, I just don't think it's realistic to try to trade. I think it's going to ultimately make for lower, lower returns over time, to be quite honest. I think he makes a great point about if this market gets moving, the shorts are way caught off size. Wall Street in general will be way caught off size because they are very positioned for bearishness in the market. Um, but yeah, I think just this whole like, you know, notion of these guys of like trying to get in, get out, get in, get out, man, it's just, it's such a tough game to play. And it sounds great, right? Like, oh, we're going to take 5% out of the market. It sounds so good in theory, but it's uh, much, much uh, easier said than done. Let's just put it that way. All right, let's get into this one now. To own tech here, Liz Young, I mean, NVIDIA down 8% in the last week. They've got earnings in, a, in another day. Uh, Meta down 8.5%, Steph. Yeah. Uh, Alphabet down 6 Microsoft down 5 Amazon down 7 uh, You know, Apple had a tough day yesterday. That stock right now, as we pull it up right here, which I typed it incorrectly, but I do it right this time, <laughs> is now at 167 So it was like, what, 174 mm -hmm. Liz, can you own tech right here and now, or now is it dangerous again? If your time horizon is six months or less, I think it's dangerous because the Fed is going to continue hiking. I agree with her. You know, if, if your whole outlook is the next three to six months, I think you're, you're playing with uh, fire, right? Every stock I buy, and I bought some stocks here today, every stock I buy, I'm looking out for the next three to five years with these stocks. And so, you know, if I was playing it for the next three to five months, am I buying those stocks today? I don't know. I think I would have to think long and hard about that. I'm like, am I really going to make that move? Hmm, I don't know, man. So uh, th that just initial point there is phenomenal. The end of this year, tightening is going to continue happening through the end of this year. If you want to get in as an entry point in tech right now while it's under pressure and then hold it for two to five years, I think it's probably okay, but it's really dependent on that. And one other point I would make is that 
even people out there that are bullish through the end of the year are not completely unhinged, right? Some of the, the highest price targets on the street are about 4,800. That would give us less than a 1% annual return. And That's a great point she just brought up there, guys. That's a great point. Think about that. I think Tom Lee's like pretty much the most bullish on, on Wall Street. He, he was talking about 4,800 for the S&P. Like she just said right there, we're talking a 1%, that would be a 1% return for this entire year. Think about that for a moment. That's how bearish the market's gotten, that the most bullish scenario is that we have a 1% return for the S&P 500 this year. Like, that's almost unheard of in almost every year in the stock market. Like, usually the, the bulls are expecting a 10 to 20% type return for the S&P 500 on the bullish side, right? So for the most bullish case to be uh, you get a 1% return for the year? Uh, yeah, that's a... Uh, that uh, I would call very, very bearish, okay? Very, very bearish uh, for the market in general. And that gets back to this whole, you know, Wall Street's kind of caught off size if the market keeps moving up. It requires is another 15% from here. And if inflation keeps coming down and we get a rally after midterms, I think that's pretty reasonable as an expectation. We'd get to the end of the year with maybe up 1%. I think we'd all be happy with that. I think anything close to the flat line would be viewed <laughs> as a massive win. Uh, Michael Farr, <laughs> See, that's how bearish, literally, that's how bearish this market is right now. That it's like, if we just have a flat line P S P this year, it's like a win. Like, that's literally how bearish the market has gotten now at this point in time. It's just, it's amazing to see that because you almost never see that in the market unless you're in a very particular time like we're in right now. Heard about tech and then I got to take a break. <laughs> you know, I, I think that we've watched tech lead this market and the big market cycles all the way through. On the downside, the NASDAQ got killed and was, was, was really, a lot of people got hurt. Those folks in the speculative tech names really got decimated. Uh, some of these tech funds Hugely, I mean, just got ruined, right? Uh, tell us something we don't know, sir, please. They bounced back hard. Probably better to find an exit point here as the Fed continues to persist with what they're doing. Longer term, if you're going to own tech, and I do, I'm owning those companies with solid balance sheets that are increasing earnings, that have uh, a good cash flow. Uh, these are companies that you stay the storms and you benefit over the long term. Which of these companies is uh, increasing earnings, though? Because basically what this guy's saying, okay, he's giving you the same, uh, I'd call it almost like lip service, that... All these uh, Wall Streeters that if they do suggest you buy, right, they're like, oh, Apple, Google, you know, uh, these sorts of stocks, Microsoft, like the, the most quintessential of these sorts of companies, right? Like, don't put any money in anything even remotely risky in tech, just those guys. But here's the deal. Apple's earnings are looking like they're going to go negative, uh, EPS-wise, right, net income-wise. Uh, Microsoft, I think, is a question mark. We'll see. Uh, Google. Look at those, you know, so I think even some of those big dogs have questionable kind of EPS trends going there, right? And so if you take those out, then, then who are you buying then at that point? If even those companies' earnings are going down, right? Companies like NVIDIA, their earnings are going to go down. So, hmm, you know, sir, like what, what are we looking at here, right? And so for me, um, the way I kind of look at this is I think it's a, I think 2022 is a great year to be uh, you know, taking risk in a lot of these stocks that you believe in for the next three to five years because you're getting such insane discounts. He just talked about <laughs> devastation, right? We see a lot of good tech companies like the PayPal's, the Shopify's, right? Many of these stocks that are down at multi-year lows, not 52-week lows, not year-to-date lows. I'm talking multi-year lows down there, right? Um, you know, you look at something like a Palantir, there's a lot of tech-related tech companies that are not the big techs yet, but in my opinion, are in this decade going to become the next big techs in this decade, right? And uh, that's kind of the way I look at it. And so I just see a lot of opportunities out there. And I think if you don't take those opportunities on a year like this, when are you going to take those opportunities? When everything's risk on again, those stocks are at 52 week highs and multi-year highs again, which they will get back to. Like, that's just kind of my thing out there when I look at it, right? I'm like, this is this is when you want to be a buyer. This is, this is when you're going through time periods like we're going through, when these stocks are at multi-year lows. These are time periods that everybody looks back on five years from now and says, gosh, I should have been buying when that stock was at a five-year low, a three-year low, a seven-year low, an all-time low, right? That's what people say. And um, unfortunately, people get so caught up in the short term that they forget about the long term that's going on with these companies, revenues, net incomes, the stories, everything across the board, right? Where their margins are going over time. And that's just kind of disappointing. So 
it's the way it is in every pretty much crash, bear market you get. It's the way it is. And then, you know, five years go by, three years go by, and people look back and like, why wasn't I buying? Oh my gosh. I, instead, I was putting all my money in, uh, you know, the, the stocks everybody told me to put money into, which were the, supposed to be the safety stocks, right? And it's just like, you know, you look at companies like PayPal, you look at companies like Shopify, Palantir, and these, these companies, right? They have very, very bright futures in front of them. Look at the balance sheets of those companies. Look at the income statements of those companies. Um, they have long runways of growth ahead of them over the next five, 10 years. And, you know, to choose to not buy those, many of those stocks, which are close to 50, to close to multi-year lows is just in my personal opinion, a big mistake because, you know, you're not always going to get, they're not always going to be trading at multi-year lows. That's just not the way it works. So anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed this video. As always, thanks for being here. Uh, 8,000 subscribers now. Crazy. Much love as always. Also, once again, if you want to get that deal, the insane Labor Day sale we're going to have for my number one stock market course ever, become a master stock market. Check out pin comment down there, enter your info, and we'll send you that deal over as soon as it drops. Much love as always, and have a great day.